Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to chapter two of surgery. Now we're gonna talk about some basic principles of trauma. What's the first thing we have to remember in trauma? Is that ABCs matter. But by itself, the ABCs are not enough to actually answer exam questions. There's no question on the US assembly or complex that's gonna say, hey, a person got hit by a train, what are you gonna do? ABC. It's not gonna be like that. They're gonna ask you specifically what to do about specific airway, ventilatory, and circulatory issues. In terms of it, the airway is basically A, and you're gonna assess and secure the airway. This can be with an oral tracheal tube, which is best to maintain airway in the absence of facial trauma. When there is facial trauma, we move to cricothyroidotomy. If we suspect cervical spine injury, what are you going to do next? Can you do an oral tracheal tube? Yes, if there is cervical spine injury, you can do an oral tracheal tube, but it's done with a flexible bronchoscopy so as to not have to flex and hyperextend the neck simply because there's cervical spine injury. What does B stand for is breathing. This is the ventilation to maintain an oxygen saturation above 90% to get that CO2 out appropriately. And then of course C is circulation. This means having access. Now, two large bore IVs are great. Otherwise, a person needs a central venous access and of course aggressive fluid resuscitation and then if need be, blood and blood product resuscitation. So let's go through the algorithm of airway compromise. First of all, if a patient has a concern for airway compromise, meaning they are altered, they have facial trauma, or they're apneic, if they do not have any of these findings, you can go ahead and go straight to assessing the breathing and oxygenation and circulation. If, however, there is concern for airway compromise, the next thing you're gonna do is say, well, I need to intubate this patient, but before you can intubate, your first question you're gonna ask yourself is, is there facial trauma? If there is facial trauma, then you're gonna go ahead and do the cricothyroidotomy. If, however, there is no facial trauma, the next question you ask yourself is, does my patient have a risk for cervical spine injury or a known cervical spine injury? The risk is, what type of traumatic event was there? Was there head injury? Was the neck involved? And if there was, then you're gonna do the careful oral tracheal intubation with the bronch. And then, if there is no cervical spine injury, then you can go ahead and go to oral tracheal intubation. Now, on the field and in real life, these questions fly through our brains instantaneously and we know what the next steps are. On the exams, they're gonna be buried deep within the vignettes and you have to be able to pull out the questions of altered mental status, facial trauma, apnea, facial trauma, cervical spine injury, and then eventually getting to the right type of intubation. So a 43-year-old woman is your first patient. She was texting while driving and lost control of her car. She ran into a tree and now has chest pain. On exam, she's breathing, uh, but she has 120 beats per minute of her heart rate. She's known JVD. Her blood pressure is low at 80 over 40. A chest x-ray shows three broken ribs over the left side of the chest, and they wanna know what type of shock is she going to be experiencing? What type of shock is she experiencing? The answer here, if you're playing along with us at home, you know that this is cardiogenic. You know this is cardiogenic simply because, first of all, there was direct impact into the chest, direct impact into the chest. Number two, you have broken ribs involved, which tells us that the impact was deep enough to actually affect the heart. There is no fever, so you can say that this is not a septic focus. Now, when we are thinking about septic foci, we need to consider the SERS criteria. There are four SERS criteria. Two or more of these criteria indicate that you have SERS. This can be a temperature under 36 Celsius or above 38, a heart rate over 90, tachypnea, meaning breathing more than 20, or the PCO2 has dropped to less than 32, a white count under 4,000 or over 12,000, and now, if two of these are there, how do you interpret these? Well, if you have two SERS criteria, you are in SERS. If two criteria plus an obvious source of infection, your patient has sepsis. If that person has two criteria plus source of infection and organ dysfunction, AKI, altered mental status, etc., then it's severe sepsis. And if they have two criteria plus source of infection and organ dysfunction and hypotension that's not getting better with fluids, 
they're in septic shock. And that is important for you to be able to pick out because they're going to ask you that same question, does this person have sepsis, severe sepsis, or septic shock? And it's going to be buried within the vignette. Now with shock, organs are going to be affected. How is your brain going to be affected? Well, if your brain is in shock, the patient's going to have confusion. How is the kidneys going to demonstrate their shock? <gasps> Increased BUN and creatinine ratio, they're going to have AKI. The liver is going to experience ischemic hepatopathy because of a low flow state and their AST ALT is going to shoot into the thousands. They're going to have chest pain and shortness of breath. They're going to have signs of hypoperfusion on their labs. What is going to happen in terms of their acid base status and signs of hyperperfusion? That's right, they're going to have lactic acid elevation. And if you look at the patient from their hemodynamic parameters, in hypovolemic shock, cardiogenic shock, neurogenic shock, and septic shock, you need to know what are the signs in terms of clinical, their CVP, what's their SVR going to be, how is their heart rate going to look, their cardiac output, their wedge pressures, and then let's go through the treatment and cause. So let's start with hypovolemic. Hypovolemic patients don't have enough preload, so they compensate by clamping down their arterioles, they end up increasing their SVR, their central venous pressures are low by definition because they, their tank is empty, and they're hyperdynamic with an increased heart rate, but their cardiac output is dropping. Their wedge pressures are also low. The way to fix these patients is they need fluids and vascular tone to help bring up their blood pressures, and the most common cause here is massive hemorrhage. The reason why they're pale and cold, well, their arterioles are clamping down. And so the surface vessels near the skin are closed off and we're shunting blood back to the core. And so these patients are actually going to be cold to touch. In cardiogenic shock, their SVR also grows up. The most common cause in this case is myocardial infarction. In cardiogenic shock, the problem is the patient can't function in their left ventricle. They can't get cardiac output moving forward. They compensate by revving up the heart rate, but the SVR also is clamped, so now they're working against higher pressures with a weakened heart, and the CVP is increased. In neurogenic shock, what happens is there's a massive loss of tone. So the CVP drops, the SVR is dropped by definition because that sympathetic tone is gone. Heart rate tries to compensate, but cardiac output and wedge pressures become compensated excuse me, decompensated. In this case, they need fluids and pressures. The pressures are there because it'll increase the sympathetic tone and hopefully bring back some of that arterial tone. The most common cause is usually cervical or thoracic spinal cord injury. Now, septic shock's a little bit different. In septic shock, the problem is you have gram-negative uh, endotoxin that's causing the patients to have a drop in their systemic vascular resistance, their SVR, that tone drops, they're also not bringing back as much CVP preload pressures as they should, their tank is empty, their heart rate goes up, but they're hyperdynamic from a cardiac output standpoint as well. The wedge pressures actually have no change. The way to treat them, well, first you've got to get control of the septic focus. That can be either drain the abscess and give antibiotics, if there is an abscess, or at least take care of what's infected with antibiotics. Fluids, and then if they're not responding to fluids, they need vasopressors. The most common causes are E. coli and Staph aureus, but of course we know there are a variety of organisms that can cause septic shock. Now when you're actually analyzing this table, you have to remember to yourself where is the initial issue. In hypovolemia, the person just doesn't have enough volume in the tank. CVP is an issue, the SVR kinds to compensate. In cardiogenic, the heart's not working. Cardiac output is a central focus of problem. In neurogenic, the SVR is an issue because there's no sympathetic tone to the arterioles. And in septic shock, it's a combination of issues with the SVR dropping and not having enough preload. Now, how do you walk yourself through the patient's vignette? Because you're going to have to do this. You're going to have to analyze patients on the ward, but you're also going to have to do it on the exam. First question you're going to ask yourself is, is the patient pale, cold, or warm and flush? If they're pale and cold, the next question you ask yourself is, is the wedge pressure different? If you do have an elevated wedge pressure, that means it's cardiogenic. What that means is that there's no volume going forward, so everything's backing up into the pulmonary capillary system. In this case, you treat the underlying cardiac problem, most common being a myocardial infarction. If the wedge pressure is decreased, that means this is hypovolemia. In this case, this person needs the tank to be filled up with fluids and pressors. If the person, however, is warm and flush, the question you ask yourself then is, 
is the cardiac output different? If it is dropped, then we know this is neurogenic, a lack of vascular tone, so they need volume and pressors. If the cardiac output change is elevated, then you have to go back to the wedge pressures. If it's low, then it's anaphylactic shock, they need epinephrine, and of course, if it's not changed, then it's septic, which means that it's septic shock, they need antibiotics, fluids, and pressors. This, by the way, is basically critical care. This is how they walk through deciding does this person have shock. So let's do a question. You have a 74-year-old woman who's in respiratory distress and altered mental status. She has a history of a stroke some years ago. Her blood pressure is low at 86 over 52. Her heart rate's elevated at 123 beats per minute. Respiratory rate is 33. She's breathing fast. Temperature is 102.3. Her SATs are low. Exam shows ronchi bilaterally with E to A changes. There's warm extremities. That means she's vasodilated. Bilateral infiltrates on a chest x-ray. What's the etiology of the hypotension is the question. Is it neurogenic, septic, hemorrhagic, hypovolemic, or cardiogenic? Now, septic shock is one of the easy ones because in a lot of patients, they're going to be febrile. And here you have a septic focus, which is basically pneumonia. And so the answer here is going to be septic shock. Your next patient's an 85-year-old woman with nausea, vomiting, and profuse watery diarrhea of four days duration. So she was recently on a cruise ship where many people fell ill due to norovirus. Today she lost consciousness. While talking to the nurse, her blood pressure is 70 over 40 and her heart rate's elevated at 140 beats per minute. They drop a Foley in the actual emergency room. It's a no urine Foley. That's concerning. This person's not making urine. What is the diagnosis here? Well, this is going to be hypovolemic shock because this person has had vomiting and diarrhea. Now, an elderly person and a baby will succumb to nausea, vomiting, diarrhea faster because they have a smaller volume of distribution than a normal adult. And so hypovolemic shock is the issue here. The next step is to get access, give a lot of fluids, and hopefully when the kidneys get perfused, that no urine Foley catheter will start putting out some urine. A 11 year old boy comes in and he was given amoxicillin for acute otitis media a few hours ago. He comes back in with respiratory distress. His eyes and lips are swollen. He has difficulty speaking. His blood pressure is 70 over 40. The heart rate's 130. He can't speak. He's got wheezing and tachycardia on thoracic exam. What is the diagnosis here? Is it anaphylactic shock, cardiogenic shock, sepsis? Did this 11-year-old have a PE or is it pneumonia? If you're jumping out of your chair and you're telling me, this is anaphylactic shock, you are correct. And if you got these questions correct, then we can stop this section on trauma and shock and move into our next area. I'll see you in the next section.